So good morning again and welcome as we start webinar one, Demystifying COVID-19 Stimulus Checks. Again, my name is Dr. Pamela Rivar jones and I would like to begin by welcome everyone who has joined onto the workshop and hello to our Facebook friends who are also watching. I would like to share with you that if you experience any problems during your uh, connection, please feel free to connect with our IT team, our support uh, staff, Tammy at 225-726-3232. Again, this is for purposes of helping you with your registration or to connect on. So let's begin. Welcome. And the purpose of our workshop series is really a combination of different facets. The purpose of our, our workshops is to aid in building awareness about the importance of financial literacy and also to discuss the need for effective financial education in light of the rollout of the federal stimulus checks to the public. The general focus of this introductory webinar or workshop is to deliver an overall response to the economic impacts of the coronavirus. Indeed, we are living in what we call different times that we're all facing and both the privileged and the poor, the working class and the unemployed are having to, to dig into, it is a major positive impact that we have when we can educate ourselves and to understand how to reduce the stress and burden of financial pains. And finally, what we want to do is to just provide information regarding the one-time payment of stimulus checks to many of the adults. So as we move into our presentation, I would like to ensure that again, everyone is aware that April is Financial Literacy Month. On March 9th of 2004, State Resolution 316 was passed and it designated that April was the month for financial literacy. This was at an educational moment, not only for adults, but also for youth. And so as you learn on the webinar today, many of our partners also provide learning opportunities to youth within the local Baton Rouge community. As we move into our presentation, Mayor Sharon Weston Groom will now provide a welcome and opening remarks and also indicate where the thought and impetus lies in us being able to provide under her leadership this incredible webinar series. I turn it over now to Mayor President Sharon Weston Brew. Well, good morning and thank you, Dr. Jones, for the introduction. I want to begin by thanking everyone who is joining our financial literacy workshop today. Our goal is to provide our community with financial educational resources, as well as prepare for the long-term effects of the coronavirus pandemic. This is an important week because qualified individuals will begin to receive their federal stimulus checks. As we move forward, a significant role in the recovery of our families, our communities, and finances. With the closure of non-essential businesses, our residents should prepare a new plan for money management and financial planning. Individuals and families need to assess their situation so they can prepare for however long this crisis may last. My intention with this program is to help our community think, create, and strategize new methods for making money stretch throughout the ongoing pandemic. This includes the expected stimulus checks the IRS is distributing. This webinar series includes six workshops, which will be hosted every Tuesday and Thursday until the end of April. This is fitting because April is Financial Literacy Month. 
These workshops will fill a critical need for effective financial education. And it is my hope this service will be shared throughout the community, especially with students, single parents, low to middle income households, and families with young children. Now more than ever, it is important for our community to create a financial plan as we move forward. And I really hope these webinars provide education and insight to support your efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Groom, and thank you for your leadership in starting our workshops. The workshop content that we have prepared for today for webinar one will consist of four parts. Part one is an explanation of the economic impact payments. We will talk about the eligibility and requirements for stimulus checks. We will also indicate how much the stimulus checks are and what this is based off of, which is income. We will share a timeline of disbursements and then a few frequently asked questions. Part two, which is led by a separate partner, will discuss the financial management section in an overview of how to move forward with this new check that is coming into our household. Three is going to be presented by Bank on Baton Rouge. This information will talk about the beginning of checking and savings accounts and the opportunities and benefits afforded to individuals. And finally, part four will be a question and answer session. And as a reminder, please be sure if you have any questions to put them into the chat room. Thank you. So our presenting partners, I am very pleased to be able to share today that we have some incredible partners that are helping us with workshop number one. We have partnered with Capital Area United Way and our speaker representing United Way is Ms. Renee Sanders. She is the executive director of ED360 Incorporated. We are also joined by Jumpstart and Jumpstart Partners, Mr. Brandon Kelly, who is with Home Bank, Jessica Sharon, representing Pelican State, and also Kimberly Champion, who is with Neighbors Bank. We also have Bank on Baton Rouge and Mr. Mel Robertson, who is the Assistant Vice President of the First Bank, will be sharing information. And then I will conclude representing the Office of the Mayor President with our Q&A session. So let's begin with part one, Capital Area United Way, presented by Verne Sanders, will now begin to share with you about the stimulus packages and the exciting information that is waiting for all of our participants to hear about. Renee, I turn it over to you for the presentation, please. So the first part that we're going to discuss is basically what is economic, uh, the stimulus package. So the first thing is, it is um, a new federal law, and it the acronym for it is CARE. So CARE stands for Corona Aid Relief Economic Security Act. And this act basically has two specific goals. The first goal is to infuse cash quickly um, into the Americans' resources, as well as designed to help in the economic recovery for the impact of COVID-19. As you know, there are over 300,000 people that have filed for unemployment. So these are different things that are able to help. The next thing that we're gonna discuss is um, who can actually receive the stimulus check. So in order to receive the stimulus check, the first thing that you have to have is a valid social security number. You also could not be claimed as a dependent for another taxpayer. You must also have an adjusted income under certain limits. And we are gonna discuss those limits uh, 
And an adjusted income can be defined as your gross income minus certain payments that you've paid during the year. So we'll go over that as well. So how do individuals qualify? So the way an individual qualifies is going to be by their most recent tax returns filed, um, either your 2018 or 2019 taxes. Um, applicants that have filed their 2019 taxes will typically receive their checks a little bit faster than applicants that are going off of 2018 taxes, but you can use either year to be able to receive um, the funds. It also, if you did not earn enough to file uh, receipt and you receive social security benefits, there isn't anything else that you'd have to do. So when I say for people that did not make enough money, I'm speaking of um, an individual, a single person with an income of $12,200 who is not required to file income taxes and then for a married couple, that would be $24,400. Those persons would be eligible um, to receive it as well. There is gonna be on the IRS website, it's um, gonna be mid-April, a non-filers form. You go on there and you're able to fill it out and you're still able to receive the um, income. The next thing is our payments, what are the payments based on? So the payments are, so basically the payments are based on, like I said, the AGI. So it is for a single family, for single filers is $75,000. For head of household filers, it's $112,500. And then for couples that are married filing jointly, it's $150,000. So also if you have a qualifying child, then uh, you can receive additional $500. Now, there are also some other um, persons who are able to receive funds as well. So if you, the threshold amount for a single filer is $99,000, the threshold amount for head of household is $136,500. And then the threshold for married couples uh, that are filing jointly is $198,000. What do I mean by threshold? This means that this is where it stops off. So if you make in between those amounts, you're still able to receive um, monies. It is just a reduced amount. So the reduced amount is $5 per $100. So for instance, for easy math, um, a person that made $75,000 would qualify. A person that made $75,100 would also qualify, but there would be $5 taken off of their stimulus payment. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is basically how these funds are dispersed. So the funds are gonna be dispersed uh, primarily through direct deposit, but they're also able to be dispersed other ways. Not everyone um, filed taxes. Some people receive social security, uh, have veteran benefits, uh, different things. So they sometimes receive actual checks. So if you, have received an actual check and that's how you receive your funds, then you will receive a check for your payment. Um, most of America though, like I said, will get the direct deposit. So the payments actually started on April the 10th and um, they should have start arriving in bank accounts uh, as early as April 13th. Now, like I said, that because some people will receive it based off of their um, previous ways that they received money, it may take some people longer. The website that I mentioned earlier, the irs.gov, the people that are non-filers can go on the website starting mid-April and they'll be able to also change their um, way that they receive the funds. So let's say for instance, last year, or they were receiving social security and they're getting it by check. If you would like to change it to direct deposit, you're able to change it online to direct deposit as well. But um, if it is by mail, it could take all the way up until September of 2020 for you to actually receive the funds. So that would be a faster way for you to see it. On the website, you will be able to look and find out, you'll be able to track your payment to see if it's actually been mailed out. You'll be able to change your bank account information as well. So um, this is the disbursement timeline of how you can actually update your information. So, um, like I said, the faster people that have filed in 2019 
the significantly slower payments uh, will basically be for your paper checks and then the bank account information. So the bank account information is huge. Also, um, another thing to remember is if you have moved, you have a change of address. That is something that also will need to be updated on the IRS's. Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk to you also about the people who don't necessarily have to take action to do anything. They're going to receive theirs. So um, that's going to be people that have worked for the railroad, like I said, social security in different places like that. Um, and the lower in low income personnel that did not have to file taxes, they'll also receive theirs as well. So these are some of the frequently asked questions um, that people have. So the first one says, do I have to pay taxes on stimulus payment? Will the stimulus check affect my tax refund? The answer to that question is no. Uh, checks are not subject to taxes, so you don't have to worry about if you will be taxed on this money. Uh, the stimulus payments will not affect your tax refund. You will still receive your full refund this year and next year as long as you file your tax return by the extended deadline. So the extended deadline is the key thing. And then the other thing is, um, what if I owe back taxes to the IRS? So if you owe back taxes to the IRS, you are still eligible um, for the stimulus payment, even if you currently owe taxes to the IRS. The coronavirus relief checks are sub not subject to taxes and the amount you receive will not be affected. It doesn't matter how big or small your balance is. Thank you, Renee, for that portion of our presentation. At this time, we would like to go into part two, which is presented by our second partner, Louisiana Jumpstart. At this time, I'd like to introduce Jessica Sharon, who will now lead part two of the presentation. Jessica, thank you, and welcome to the workshop. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Uh, my name is Jessica Sharon. I'm the Director of Financial Outreach at Pelican State Credit Union, and I'm a proud board member of the Louisiana Jumpstart Coalition for Personal Financial Literacy. And we're excited to share with you today some uh, great financial overview information on how to manage your money that you'll be getting in this stimulus check and how to make the most of it. So first we're gonna start with the um, uh, kind of a financial overview. Um, we're gonna talk to you about assessing needs and wants during a disaster, how to optimize your stimulus check to get the most for your money, saving for emergencies in the future, because that's also really important right now um, it, with the current situation that we're in to prepare for future things that may come up. Uh, debt management and elimination. Now is a good time to lower our spending where possible and use any extra money to do that. And then some money management resources that are available to you. You can go to our website, louisianajumpstart.org to get more access to free financial education services in our clearinghouse. You can also look into our speakers bureau, especially if you're working with a group, um, maybe it's a school or a youth group or even an adult group, <clears throat> excuse me, where we would actually be able, many of our partners would be able to do similar uh, webinars like this on specific topics um, remotely. Uh, so we're here to offer financial education resources um, to the community and to different groups and businesses throughout the community. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Kim Chapman. She is the financial literacy coordinator at Neighbors Federal Credit Union. And she's gonna to talk to us about identifying financial priorities. Kim? Good morning. So yes, I wanted to talk to you for just a moment on identifying and finance, um, prioritizing your finances. And so for starters, just keep it simple. Do not stress. There is a lot going on, and of course, you're not in this alone. Many other people are gonna be going through the same financial ups and downs that you may be facing. 
And so just take a deep breath and try and keep it as simple as possible. So first, I want to focus on budgeting. And a budget is basically a simple plan for your money. It helps you get a good understanding of how much money you have and then what and who do you owe and gives you a really good picture of do you have enough to take care of those needs. Now, for many of you listening, you're going to have your own unique circumstance. Some of you may be facing a total loss of income. Some of you, it could be a reduction of income. And then there may be some where your income status has not changed at all. But when doing a budget, especially today, you want to keep in mind that your circumstance could change overnight. So when you're creating a budget, you want to focus on today, but also keep in mind having a plan B. So first, let's look at what all of your financial resources are available. You want to include any savings or emergency savings that you have. If you have put money aside for an emergency, now is the time to look at the possibility of having to use that money. If you're going to have SNAP benefits, if you're going to be receiving unemployment, if you have any side income, you want to even include any loose change that you may be saving around your household. So first assess all of the financial resources that you have available. And again, when you're creating your budget, you want to write down everything that you have that you owe. But again, you want to prioritize four things that you want to look at first and foremost. Housing. You want to make sure that you keep a roof over your head. So make sure you're looking at taking care of your rent or your mortgage. If you are unable to take care of those needs, make sure that you are reaching out to your landlords, to your mortgage companies to find out what your options are. Partial payment, deferred payment, or even sometimes refinancing. So make sure that you are taking care of housing first. Next, utilities. You want to be able to keep the lights on. In talking about your life, do everything that you can to minimize those bills. Turn off the lights when you're not when it's not necessary. Use natural light. Unplug things that you're not using within the household, but you want to definitely make sure that you are keeping your lights on. Food. Make sure that you are taking care of your ability to feed yourself and your family. Take stock of what you have in your home, and then when you do go shop grocery shopping, make a list and be sure you're getting exactly what you need and saving the extras for some time later. Next, medication. You want to make sure that you are taking care of any medical needs that you have. This may be a good opportunity to reach out to your physicians and see if they have free samples available if there may be a less expensive version of the medication that you take, but before making any changes, definitely speak with your physician. But any of these measures can help reduce your overall expenses. And then of course, there's going to be transportation. Make sure that you're taking care of your car insurance. Make sure that you're taking care of having fuel and even take care of your major maintenance because skipping some, some maintenance today may hurt you or cost you more in the long run. Communicate letters. Communicate with anybody that you are unable to pay. Again, because you're not in this circumstance alone, many organizations are going to be willing to help you defer your payments, make partial payments, or look at possible refinancing options. Now I want to focus a little bit on housing. You want to look for ways to save money within your household. I mentioned earlier ways of cutting back on your utilities, setting your thermostat at maybe a higher temperature. That will go a long way into being able to keep those lights on altogether. When you're shopping, shop sales, plan your meals, even meal prepping can help. Shop with a list. But at the end of the day, there are also going to be a lot of resources that may help you be able to get free food. The food bank. Many of our local schools are serving for lunch and breakfast. 
may be given in perishable and non-perishable items. Next, I want to spend a minute talking about savings. Even though this may be an opportunity for you to dip into the savings that you have, you want to make sure that you still use a budget and only take out the resources that you need. And it is still going to be important to save money. The stimulus check is a one-time payment and your expenses are going to continue month after month. So if you have the ability to save some of that money, definitely do so. If you're in a circumstance where your income has not been affected, this would be a great opportunity for you to increase your savings or to start a saving. The ideal savings plan should be three to six months of your living expenses. And again, your living expenses is not going to include your entertainment or fun things. It's going to be your basic necessities housing, food, utilities, transportation, and medication. And then finally, you want to make sure that you are spending your tax impact check responsibly. Consider delaying new purchases that you may have previously had planned, home improvements, trips, all of those things can be delayed until another time. Avoid creating new debt. Only use credit cards if it becomes absolutely necessary. Remember to make sure that you are planning not just for today, but also for next month's expenses. So if you do have extra income after you've covered to this month's expenses, you want to make sure that you spread it over the next month and the next month. Again, this is a time where everybody's finances are being affected. There are going to be lots of resources like this webinar to give you direction or insight on how to save and how to prepare and make it through this time. Next, I believe we have Brandon Kelly. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Brandon Kelly, Community uh, Reinvestment Officer for Home Bank. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we manage our finances th during this time. Um, one thing you have to understand is that, um, you know, uh, the old adage says that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So having a strategy with managing your finances is going to be critical in order for you to be successful and not only thrive, uh, survive but thrive uh, through this uh, this situation uh, with our economy. So at the end of the day, it's very important for us to understand that um, if you have lost your job or seen a dramatic decrease in your hours, um, you, uh, if you use these stimulus dollars, you need to use those for your basic needs, for for your survival. So that's very critical for us to understand that um, there are we're going to have different strategies depending on where we are financially in this situation. Um, so you have to focus on you and the success and the survival of you and your family as most important. Um, but if you are somewhat secure in your um, in your job, if you you've had seen a pretty consistent hour base for your job and whatnot, um, we can develop some additional strategies going forward. Uh, we always like to say, uh, pay yourself first. So when you get these stimulus dollars, the most important thing is to take a little bit and put it towards your savings account. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a hundred dollars, maybe it's two hundred dollars, whatever you can afford. But pay yourself first and put that in a savings account that is um, that is away from your primary financial institution, so that you've got at least you've put a little bit uh, for uh, a rainy day or for the future. Um, you have a responsibility to protect not only yourself right now, but yourself in the future. Uh, but I will say, if you have the uh, this opportunity. Uh, general practice is you want at least a thousand dollars in an emergency fund. If you can do that, that will set you up very well to take the next few steps in being financially successful. Um, so uh, having a thousand dollars, if you have the opportunity, again, as we say, this uh, uh, this 
uh, stimulus dollars. Um, you have this is this is your opportunity. So take a thousand dollars and put it into a savings account for you in the future as an emergency fund because things can often happen. You know, we want to, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's very important to understand that, yes, we didn't expect uh, this pandemic to occur, but it is important to know that the economy is always going to have peaks and valleys. So we have to be prepared uh, for it. not just situations like this, but any economic issue that occurs uh, with, uh, with us. So having an emergency fund or, or, or having money set aside into some type of savings vehicle is going to be really critical and important. Um, as Kim said uh, a moment ago, uh, generally, we like to have three to six months that's an ideal goal, to have three to six months of your basic living expenses in some type of savings vehicle for the unforeseen that may happen. And we, again, she says basic. Uh, I like to call it your beanie weenie budget. Uh, and again, that is if you had to just survive, make sure that your mortgage is paid, your rent is paid, your lights are on, and you're eating beanie weenies every, um, uh, every day, that is what you could survive off of. So I think it's very important to understand that. And again, you also have an opportunity with this fund. If you've got a significant amount of money stashed away in your savings account, uh, you can start planning for a vacation. Or if you're looking to purchase a home, you can use this to grow that down payment um, uh, fund. Or if you're looking to purchase a car, you can put that towards your down payment fund for that. Um, now going on to, to debt. Uh, because it's in, this is a great opportunity as well to reduce your debt. If you have a bill that has become outstanding or a collection that out, that's outstanding and it's driving down your credit score, this is a great opportunity to engage um, to engage these funds with that. So uh, it's important to know that um, there's a, the status, the, uh, the, a program called a debt snowball. That is a debt reduction strategy that allows you to start with your lowest balance uh, creditor. Uh, let's say you have multiple credit cards, you'll, still, you'll start off with a credit card that has the lowest balance. You'll, you'll put a lot of energy into, into paying that, of course, while paying the other ones, but putting a lot of energy into paying that one. And then once you've paid that all off, then you go to the next lowest uh, balance, and you'll continue to keep going until uh, hopefully you reduce your debt uh, altogether, and then we can start really uh, doing some great work with saving and investing your dollars. Um, as well as you, it's also important for you to know when it's when is when is it uh, possible to borrow. I think it's great to ask yourself three questions: Do I really one? Do I really need the money? Two. Are there other ways for me to finance this purchase or this, this need? And three, can I afford to pay back the money once I've, bought, I've borrowed it? Now, if you can't really, if you don't really have a great answer for any of those three questions, it really, you really should uh, question if you should be, per, should be borrowing those funds. As well as with all of this, uh, understanding your interest rate is really important because the difference between a low interest rate and a high interest rate can be the difference of paying uh, a credit or a bill off um, on the short term, or it can be you could be paying it over the longer term and paying a lot more money because you you're paying a higher interest. And again, at the end of the day, this is a time for you to protect your credit score because your credit score is such an important piece of who you are. It is it allows you to give you a lot more financial buying power and a lot more opportunities. So make sure that you uh, you are maintaining. Uh, a good relationship with your creditors. Uh, if you are having some type of issue, make sure you contact your bank or your credit union, whoever your creditor is, to ensure that uh, you are maintaining a strong financial file so that in the long run you can be successful. I'll now turn it back off to the mayor who will introduce uh, Mel. So thank you, Brandon. Um, now we will have part three, which is going to be presented by Bank on Baton Rouge. And I'd like to welcome Mel Robertson from the First Bank. 
No, thank you for being a part of our workshop and I turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you all certainly for the opportunity. Right. Definitely appreciate it. And again, my name is Mel Robertson with the First Bank, Assistant Vice President, Community Development and CRA Officer. Today we want to share with you uh, really the importance of checking and savings accounts. We want to talk a little bit about the benefits of having uh, at least one of them, if not both of them, certainly the benefits of direct deposit, auto payments, uh, debit card, certainly in times like this, but even beyond uh, the COVID-19 impact and certainly how that there are zero or low cost accounts that are available uh, through our Bank on Baton Rouge partners. One of the things that we want to certainly encourage you to keep in mind is that there are many benefits to having deposit accounts, one of which is the safety and security that is offered. Uh, another is there's no check cashing fees when you are a customer of your respective institution. There are also or the zero low cost accounts that we certainly want to encourage you to be able to take advantage of. And it helps you to really be able to get in the habit of saving uh, money as Brandon has already uh, mentioned, or have you been able to kind of keep that piece in mind as we're all impacted economically uh, by COVID-19, is being able to pay yourself. But in being able to pay yourself and having an account, what have you, it makes it sometimes a little bit easier to save money because it can be out of sight, out of mind. And, if you don't have it readily available, sometimes you're able to resist the temptation, if you will, to spend those dollars. The other thing it helps you to do is manage your money more easily. It's easier to keep track of your money, of your spending, when you have a bank account, um, because you're also able to take advantage of some of the services. For instance, with having to, having in a bank account, having direct deposit, being able to get your stimulus checks electronically, that potentially allows for you to get those dollars sooner uh, than later versus having to wait for them in the mail, uh, being able to pay any responsibilities that you may have to pay, uh, whether that be online. And sometimes that means you're able to not only keep yourself safe by not having to go out or what have you, you don't have to go out, but also you can avoid having uh, to uh, pay additional fees that you wouldn't have to pay because you're having the ability to pay them online or not having to send these things through the mail and there being delays potentially in them getting to the respective creditors. Uh, also having the ability because of having the account, most institutions or a lot of institutions do offer a free bill pay service that allows for you to pay your monthly or weekly responsibilities that you want to pay through the service because you are a customer of the institution. Uh, being able to utilize really online banking it's helpful because you're able to see what's going in and what's coming out of your account. I think that's always important for you to pay attention to, um, certainly in times like this, but even beyond, because it helps to really build great habits in, in terms of your relationship with your money. And also having the ability to do mobile banking. That's something that is so uh, important because a number of people have phones and it's so easy to have your bank or institutions uh, app, if they have an app on your phone or be able to do your banking from your phone, even if you don't have a laptop or an iPad or any of these other devices, if you have a phone, it still gives you uh, a great advantage to be able to manage your account, to be able to manage your spending, to be able to manage your, your savings. And these things are highly important for you to be uh, continued on the road of success with regard to developing relationships with your local financial institutions. Uh, certainly with regard to establishing accounts, it allows for you to eliminate the elimination of check cashing fees. We know that those fees can be astronomical. They can add up, you know, five here, 10 bucks here, you know, nine bucks here. These things add up, especially if you're being paid weekly. Uh, th these are dollars that you're able to keep because you have a bank account. Um, you also, um, you have the option to be able to prevent certainly overdraft fees uh, with regard to, because you're having to handle on how you're spending your money, knowing what money is allocated for what responsibilities. And then just so you know, we know life happens to everyone. 
So even if you've had situations where maybe there's been some um, incidents with regard to uh, check, checking uh, account privileges, uh, we do have second chance checking and savings. I think of it as a second look program to be able to give you an opportunity to revisit uh, being able to establish uh, deposit accounts with your local financial institutions. Uh, we at the First Bank are one of a number of institutions that are part of the bank on uh, Baton Rouge financial partners. We also have many of the other banks, uh, Bancorp South, Campus Federal, uh, EFCU Financial, Essential, Iberia, Mid Neighbors, Pelican, Red River, State Bank and Trust. And again, we certainly want you all to be safe and in this time, and also want you to take advantage as much as you can of being able to uh, take advantage of second chance or second look programs of being able to, to establish a positive relationship with your local institution. So with any of us, we certainly welcome the opportunity to be able to do that and to be able to uh, serve you in that capacity. And we thank you again for your time, even on this call. Um, do we have any questions? No, thank you for sharing that information on checking and savings. And so I'd like to go to the next slide because it is now time for our question and answer session. And as we go into this Q&A period, I wanna start with a slide that indicates a question that was just recently posed. So if I could have the next slide, which shows an indicator of responses that individuals have responded to. The question is, how will you respond? So what will you do with your stimulus check? If you're found eligible and you receive a payment, what is your plan for spending? So one of our sources did a survey with a little less than 2,000 U.S. adults. They were surveyed just a few weeks ago, March 21st. And again, the question was, if the U.S. government were to approve a stimulus package, giving each American $1,000, to which categories would you allocate the most money? So each respondent had the option to choose any of the three categories that are listed. And as you can see, the category that had the highest response was for food or for household goods. 65% of the population indicated that they are going to use it for their basic essentials. And that's exactly what we were learning on our webinar uh, from Brandon, that we want to be able to allocate towards the beanie weenie budgets, as he called it. The next category was savings. 48% of the respondents said that they would be preparing to put their stimulus check into a savings account. And that's what we just heard from Mel with Bank on Baton Rouge, that individuals have the option to get a second chance checking or savings account. We also see that health and wellness products are a big part of what individuals are looking for. This was the third highest response with 31%. So again, just looking at how individual respondents actually um, replied to this particular question, we would like for our Baton Rouge community to begin thinking of what would your top three responses be and planning, preparing in advance for how you intend to utilize your money and to be wise about your spending patterns. Let's go to the next slide, which cues us up for our Q&A period. I'd like to start with a question that is posed to Ms. Kimberly Chapman. And the question for him reads, what is the best way to start saving for money, saving your money for a savings or checking account. Really? Kim, you may have to unmute your line. 
to be able to respond there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. One of the easiest ways to start a savings account is to set up an automatic draft. That way you can set it and forget it. So whether it's a payroll deduction or something that you have automatically drafted from your bank account, you can set aside a designate, designated amount that automatically goes into a savings account. That way you're not dependent on yourself to have to stop and sacrifice and put the money into your account. It will automatically go. Start with your savings account at the financial institution that you have, or if you think you're going to be tempted to spend that money, you may want to do a savings account at another institution to avoid that temptation. But automatic draft payroll deduction is one of the easiest ways to set money aside. Thank you, Kim. That's an excellent first step and, and suggestion. I want to go to a second question that I see here, and this question is for Brandon. The question reads, should I connect my emergency fund to my checking account? Or Brandon, should these be separate accounts? Well, um, I, you know what, I think this is a, um, a great question. Um, for me personally, I think that if you can find another financial institution, um, a, a bank, another bank, a credit union, uh, or even an online uh, savings account and put that separately, not connected, uh, that's your best strategy. Because um, if it's connected to your everyday checking account, there is always that bit of temptation. Um, oh, I really want that dress at Dillard's, or, or I really want to go and have a nice meal. Uh, I'll just dip a little bit into uh, that savings account. So really you want to keep it disconnected from your everyday dealings uh, in order for you to make sure that one, it stays protected, it can continue to grow and that you can be successful. Thank you, Brandon, for that response. I want to go to our chat room now. We actually have a question here, which is for Renee. Renee, the question is, will we be required to pay back the stimulus checks or pay taxes on it in the next year's taxes? Renee, your response to that? No, you're not required to pay back any money and you it will not affect your income taxes for next year. Thank you. One, one other question, Brene, uh, keeping in, in the same scope of, of questions there. Um, the question comes and it, it reads, I heard payments for dependents age 17 to 23 are not part of the stimulus payment. Have they made provisions to give money for these dependents that are missed in this payment or not? To the best of your knowledge, Renee. So to the best of your knowledge, they currently have not made any provisions. Um, that is still the way it stands. Um, to my knowledge, it is um, basically even though that they're still able to be in the household for it for it to be considered a qualifying dependent, they have to be under that 17 years old. And if they're under the 17 years old, then that you would qualify for the additional $500 uh, for the dependent. Thank you, Renee. You're welcome. The next question is for Mel. Mel, the question reads, what if I had issues with a bank account in the past? Can I still open an account now? So the next question is, um, yes, potentially can still open an account now. We would certainly you know, um, want you to disclose to us what those circumstances were that created whatever those hiccups were. And maybe what um, strides you've taken to address some of those things. More importantly, what were those life circumstances that led to that? And what are we going to do differently to prevent it going forward? So, as we embark into a new relationship, we have a new clear expectation of, uh, for how this is going to be able to progress, not only for you, but also with regard to the relationship with the institution. 
Thank you, Mel. We have another question that's coming from our chat room, and this is for either Kim or Brandon to answer. And it reads, do you recommend placing money in a certificate of deposit at this time? Is that wise for them to do? Well, I, I'll take that, uh, Brandon. Um, I, you know what, I'll say this. I think um, any strategy uh, that it involves um, saving is always good. Uh, now, again, rates are not phenomenal, but rates are not phenomenal anywhere. So as long as if you're taking money and you're putting it into a safe, sound uh, savings vehicle, such as a certificate deposit, a money market account, a traditional savings account, anything that is you putting your money into a saving, into some type of savings vehicle is going to be a good idea no matter what. Would you like to respond or Brandon to that? Yes, I agree with what Brandon is saying that putting your money into a savings account, even a CD, would be a good plan. I would take into account, make sure that you have liquid resources because what you would not want to do is put it in a CD today and then face a penalty two months from now because you need that money. So if you are going to put money into a CD, make sure that you have other savings or other cash available to you in case there is an emergency or in case you do need funds um, outside of your regular income. Excellent. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, let's go to the next question. And this question is for Vinay. If my college age son is a dependent on my tax return and I don't get a check, will he get one? If your college age son was a dependent on your tax return and you don't get a check, it is because of his age, he's in between that 17 to 23. That's why you would not get the check. And the answer to the question is he would not get the check either because um, he was a dependent on your income taxes. That's one of the um, disqualifying factors. If you were on somebody else's tax return as a dependent, you would not be el eligible to uh, get the stimulus check on your own. Thank you, Brene. One other question that just came in is, will elderly persons that are carried as dependents be considered for the $500 qualification? They will not be considered a qualified person. You have to be under that 17 year uh, age mark. Okay, thank you. The next question is for Kimberly. Kim, the question is, uh, how do I adjust drastic decreases to drastic decreases in my income? I think the question is saying is like, how do they navigate through the fact that they were once having a you know salary that was coming in and now if this person is unemployed, how do they adjust now to not having an income? What your expenses are, where do you spend? Okay. And things of that sort. And look at the things that you can live with and things that you can live without. And so you want to make sure that when you're making that adjustment that you are including those critical things that you have to be able to take care of and then prioritize everything else on that list in terms of your expenses or your lifestyle afterward. Thank you, Kim. Brandon, I have a question that's come in for you. What is more important, saving money or reducing debt, as you alluded to? Well, I think what's um, it really depends on your financial situation. Um, at the end of the day, as I said in, in my 
uh, portion of the presentation. Um, having that thousand dollars or having some uh, strong emergency uh, fund is critical because once we do get out of uh, uh, the pandemic and, uh, you know, things can always happen. So having uh, some uh, type of emergency fund is critical for your success. And once you've gone past there, then let's start making let's let's kind of look at our situation. Um, you know, if you ha if you have an increasingly bounding uh, amount of debt, uh, it's it, it it definitely would be important to uh, start tackling that. Um, I'm, I've always said let's definitely ta tackle debt. Uh, but I think we can save at the same time. So, uh, of course, when you're looking at your debt, let's look at the ones that have the greatest interest rates. Let's look at the ones that um, uh, that are uh, causing you the most issues. Uh, because, all, uh, but also while you're paying off debt, let's also. Um, as, as Kim alluded to with the automatic uh, 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 transfers. Uh, Put, uh, set aside a few dollars uh, for, uh, it, with each paycheck uh, because it, it, it all, often doesn't have to be an either or. We can absolutely pay down debt and start saving at the, at the exact same time. Thank you, Brandon, for that response. Um, our next question comes in for Renee, and that question reads, if I don't file a tax form, because I don't have enough income to, to do that. What if I don't, pardon me, what if I don't file a tax form because I don't have enough income to do that? So if you don't, uh, the question is, if you don't file a tax return, are you still eligible for money? Is that the question? The question reads, if I don't file a tax form because I don't have enough income to do that, what do I do? If you don't file a tax form, you don't have enough money to do that, you need to go on the irs.gov and fill out the non-filers form, and you will still be eligible to receive the funds. question reads, and this question is for Mel. Um, the question reads, why is a debit card better than carrying cash? Can an individual right now only operate with a debit card? Thanks for the question. A debit card has benefits just simply because you don't have to really carry cash. A lot of merchants or vendors accept a Visa or MasterCard logo. Again, good for the money that you have in your bank account, of course. And not only that, depending on, you know, when you swipe your card, it may also allow for you to have some levels of zero liability um, because of using your card, you know, as credit, uh, if you will. So it's, so it's safer than using cash but also understanding that it's only good for the amount of cash you have in your bank account. So, you know, you're not having to walk around with your stimulus check in your pocket. I'm not encouraging that. Deposit into a bank account and just use your uh, card as you see fit, reasonably speaking, to make purchases that you may need to make uh, for your family or for yourself or your household. Okay, thank you, Mel. We have a question that's coming in on the chat line and it says, should we invest money in stocks and bonds? And if so, how and where should a person start this investment for starters? And I'd like to open that up to all of the presenters on the call who would like to respond to this one. Again, the question is asking, should we invest money in stocks and bonds Again, this is your personal opinion. And if so, how and where should they start this investment if they're a starter? This is Mel. 
what I would say to anyone who's wanting to or considering doing it, certainly there are a number of companies whose stocks or shares are fairly low right now because of what's happening. Um, you can certainly go trade free to establish some of these uh, free trading accounts, whether it be with uh, E-Trade or Fidelity. I would also caution you to say that, you know, understand that it is your money that you're putting at risk. And so if you are um, willing uh, to lose potentially some of your money and you're comfortable with that risk, then by all means, it would have you pursue it. If you're not comfortable losing any of your money, then you may just want to leave your money in your savings account. But certainly there are some uh, lower hanging fruit out there. But anytime you're doing any investing, there's some level of risk that's in involved. You just have to ask yourself, do you believe the reward is greater than the risk that you're taking on? And if so, then you make your moves calculated accordingly. Um, I'd like to add um, a little, uh, uh, just to piggyback on, on what Mel uh, said. I think it's, uh, it's really important. Uh, a lot of times uh, you are investing and not even knowing. Um, uh, so are you participating in your company's 401k plan? Uh, and if you are, um, are you uh, are you maxing out that uh, in terms of uh, maxing out to get the most in terms of the matching dollars that your company is putting in? Um, do you have a significant amount of savings or uh, uh, in your savings account? Because uh, that's it, that's important. And then once you maxed out your 401k, you maxed out uh, or, or not maxed out, but uh, you're comfortable in your savings strategy. Yeah, great. Let's do some investing. I always say uh, finding a, a respected, um, qualified, certified financial advisor will always be super important and recommended uh, because you want someone that knows the industry and that is going to uh, it's going to uh, put you into um, stocks and bonds and investments that uh, meet your goals and your strategies for long term success. Hey, Bernie, thank you for responding to that also. Um, the next question is actually to all of the presenters again, and I'm going to start off with um, with Jessica, who's on, if you'd like to begin, and then we'll just rotate through. The question is in regards to uh, using credit cards to make ends meet during this time. What is, in your opinion, is it good to utilize credit cards if I'm unemployed or if a person is underemployed? So again, this question is still to all of our presenters. If you're unemployed or underemployed, should this person use credit cards to make in? Um, so credit cards become a very become a very tricky subject when you're thinking about using it, um, using them for a longer term. Um, I can certainly understand the need for uh, unemployment or underemployment because at some point, um, additional unemployment and the um, stimulus checks and things like that will run out. And if we're not all back to work, we may not be able to make ends meet. Um, of course, like we've talked about plenty, let's you know tap into our savings that, if that we need to, let's tap into our emergency fund. But the reality is that I think it's over 40% of Americans don't have an emergency fund and could not handle a $400 emergency if it happened to them today. Um, so the reality is that a lot of people will have to use credit cards. What we really wanna stress in this time is only for absolute necessities. If you have no other options, you've gone to the food banks, you've reached out to the local churches, you've you know, got on Facebook to find out what resources are there, you're getting school, you know, if you have children, you're getting that school lunch um, options if it's available in your area. 
try to exhaust all of the no cost options first because there are a lot of them right now and you're going to save yourself money in the long run. You may come to a point where you have to use your credit cards. Maybe you've already contacted your financial institution to delay payments. Maybe you've already used all the free resources. Maybe you've already used your emergency fund. Focus on spending that is necessity based. Housing, food, medication, utilities. Like we said before, keep, keep your family fed and healthy and keep the lights on. Those are really, really important things right now um, that, that would necessitate using your credit card for an emergency. And the reason why we say try not to use it other than an emergency is because we're going to have to pay it back, right? We're going to have to pay it back with interest. And if you are in a situation of unemployment or underemployment, it's going to be difficult to make higher payments as your balance increases. And it can also affect your credit score as your balance increases as well. So um, my suggestion would be try to exhaust all the other resources available and then move on to just necessity purchases if you're going to be using your credit cards. Response, Jessica. Let's go now to Jamel to respond to the same question. Thanks again. With regard to credit cards, they are a tool. A tool that's in the toolbox for when an opportunity should arise that that tool needs to be used. As Jessica has already mentioned, you still have to pay the bill. Certainly, if you are being impacted in a way to where you are unemployed or underemployed, you have to be mindful of your usage with a credit card because the bill is still coming due. Uh, if you are able to exercise a level of discipline and still pay the balance in full once it comes due, then uh, sure, there's no additional interest in which you're paying. Um, there is certainly a level of protection by using a credit card. When in doubt, if you have the cash, use the cash, go ahead and you. Um, but if you don't have the cash and you feel like if you have the cash, you can still make the purchase. And if you swipe your card and holding on to that cash to pay the bill when it comes due, then I think that's a great approach to utilization of a credit card. Again, they are great tools, but they do have to be managed properly. And certainly uh, in times like this, um, this can be more of a situation where you have to be mindful of, of really the temptation, if you will, just to swipe, 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 because things can be really in disarray. So just keep those things in mind and use it if you have to. If you don't, if you have the cash, just make the cash purchase or having hold off on the credit purchase. Uh, for maybe not only another time, but maybe when things are differently, where you know that you can pay your statement balance in full so you can avoid the interest. Thank you for that response. Kimberly, would you like to respond also that, to that question? And again, we're referring to the use of credit cards in order to make ends meet. Yes, I want to piggyback just on what both Mel and Jessica said, in that if you find yourself where you have to use your credit card, make sure that it is strictly for an emergency. But even in that circumstance, try to make a plan. Look at what is going to be your ability to pay this back. Would you be able to pay mm -hmm. it back if you were not in this circumstance? Are you able to meet at least the minimum payment? Because the last thing that you want to do is create debt that even once your income returns that you're not able to afford. And then when you're assessing, looking at using credit cards, use them wisely. If you have multiple credit cards, look at the credit cards that have the best benefits that may have the lowest interest rate, that may waive over the limit fees, that may waive late payments. You want to make sure that if you are going to use a credit card that it is going to put you in the be a better circumstance and not necessarily a worse circumstance. Thank you, Kimberly, for that response. Um, there's a two-part question that's coming in directed to Brandon. So I'm gonna switch this over. Brandon, 
The question is in regards to emergency funds. I know that we have another webinar that focuses on this, but the question is two part. One, should I use my stimulus check to start my emergency fund? And secondly, if I'm on a fixed income and not able to start with a thousand dollars, what's the amount that I should use to start off? Great question. Um, I'll say this, um, you know, not only do um, I think it's, uh, it's a good idea, I think it's a great idea to utilize uh, all, if not uh, some, if not all of your stimulus check for an emergency fund. Um, so I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, and I think really you have to make sure, you have to see what is in, in your best interest. Um, if you have done the math and with everything that's going on, uh, I can't afford to put all 1200 or all uh, however much uh, into a savings account, uh, taking half of it, taking $500 um, is a start. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the old adage says that uh, a long journey starts with a single step. And uh, if you can make that first baby step into setting up that savings account, um, I think that would be uh, critically important to uh, your long-term success. So I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, and again, as I said, you've got to look at your situation and, and find what you could be comfortable with um, uh, putting towards a savings account and, and doing that. Okay. This, this next question is posed to Renee, and the question reads, I just lost my job last month. However, I made too much in 2018 and 2019 to qualify for stimulus checks. Therefore, um, or actually they're saying, but I need a check. So <laughs> do I get one? What's your answer to that? They've made too much money in 2018 and 19 to qualify, but they lost their job last month. Will they get it? If you are lost last month, you are in a tough spot and likely among the people that actually need to check the most. And um, it is likely, but actually if your 2018 and 2019 income was too high for you to qualify, you would not get the check automatically um, deposited into your account in the next couple of weeks. You may, however, see um, a $1,200 deposit in the next couple of weeks. And uh, also the tax credit, I'm sorry, the tax credit, you would be eligible for that in uh, 2021. You can apply for that. You would get the tax credit for that. Does that make sense? Or maybe I should. Basically, if you look at the tax credit um, the 2020, since it happened in 2020, you'd be eligible to apply for it whenever you get it in 2021. And uh, technically, I know that that's a really small comfort, but that is what you would be able to do. Okay. So, what I understood you to say is that this $1,200 in the form of a tax credit, when you file, it would be eligible for the 2020 taxes in 2021, correct? Okay, excellent. So Kim and Brandon, I have a question that's coming in for you and that for both of you rather, and it says, would you recommend using the stimulus funds to, to pay toward old debt and explain how would a person go about doing that? How do you pay towards this? old debt that exists with the stimulus That's okay. either for Tim or Brandon. Okay, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, you know, if, if you have, I, I think you really have to um, look at the situation 
Um, what part of when we talk about credit and credit scores, um, if a uh, if a collection has been on your credit file for uh, uh, for a significant amount of time, let's say uh, six years or so, uh, eventually that's actually going to fall off of your credit uh, your credit report. Um, so it may not. Uh, so you may have to. Uh, um, make a judgment call for, um, during those situations. Uh, but if it's a relatively recent um, uh, collection debt, uh, certainly uh, it's a, it is a great idea for you to, to, uh, to pay off those old debts. I think what you do is you contact uh, that creditor um, and, and have that conversation. And uh, they actually may even uh, make some uh, concessions with you uh, for, for utilizing those funds. Uh, in, in such a, in such a way. So uh, yeah, I think that's uh, you know if it's a more recent uh, um, uh, debt, certainly pay it off. Absolutely, absolutely. Kim, do you want to add anything to that? I agree with Brandon. Sometimes I agree with Brandon that sometimes your older debts may be on the verge of falling off of your credit report. So it is an individual circumstance where you may want to have somebody review your credit to see would it be more beneficial to pay off an old debt or concentrate on some of the newer debt that you may have because your credit score is really impacted a great deal by the activity in the most recent 24 months. And so it may be a circumstance where somebody can look at and evaluate how these funds would be better used taking care of debt that you may have that's current or new versus what the outcome may be if you actually apply it to the old debt. But again, if it's if that's the only debt that you have, then it would definitely be recommended that you go ahead and take care of it. Thank you both for that. Just a couple of last questions. This one is asking, uh, what if I'm married but filing separately? How would that impact me? What do I need to do to get my check? And this question is for Brene. If you're married and filing separately, in order to get your check, you would just follow the same thing. It's whatever you on your income taxes from last year um, or the, your last time that you filed, that is where uh, you would get your check information from. So um, the income for married filing separately is still the uh, 75,000. And if you filed head of household, then it'd be $112,500. Again, uh, Renee, on this one, who's going to be able to claim any children dependents? What advice goes for that? Who is going to be able to? So that it would be whoever in the 2018 or the 2019 taxes. That's where the $500 uh, additional amount would, would be placed based on who claimed the dependent, correct? That's correct. Thank you. One additional question that we have is in regards to individuals, more than 75% uh, indicate that they're managing their finances on their own, whether they're living from paycheck to paycheck or have a healthy financial portfolio. In your opinion, how do we and for the unexpected when every day is changing, whether we have income or now we don't have an income. How should we be planning? And I really see this question as perhaps for those who do have an income, how should they be planning? So uh, this is Jessica. Um, I think one of the, the most important things that people can do, especially if you still have an income, um, is, is follow a lot of the, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the tips that we shared, uh, which is, you know, taking care of your necessities first, um, creating your budget to make sure that you're managing your money effectively over this time getting that emergency fund set up and beyond that additional savings for other expenses uh, that may happen. 
um, paying your bills on time if you can. Um, like we've we've talked about, just because uh, there are bans on evictions and foreclosures and things like that, um, it doesn't mean that we need to to stop paying those items if we can afford to, because eventually that money will be owed. <clears throat> so I think that the best thing people can do is, <clears throat> excuse me, is to put uh, put their budget together and and put a plan in place that says, okay, you know, if we have a hurricane later this year, we've got this money set aside. If we have, you know, a life event, um, we have to get our air conditioner fixed. You know, we've got this money set aside. I think the most important thing to do um, is create those plans. Sit down with your significant other, your family members, whomever you're pooling resources with, and and create that idea of, okay, so if something happens, this is how we're going to do it together. Um, it, it's kind of kitchen table economics, you know, thinking about all the different things that can happen and how we can be prepared. If you don't have an income right now, that's a very different picture. And planning may look a lot more like finding resources. United Way has some amazing resources through 211. Uh, finding uh, help with food and shelter and the things that your family needs, medication. Um, so I, I think that it's a totally separate type of planning. Uh, but as people get back to work and start getting an income or their income goes back to what they consider normal, they'll be able to start doing more financial planning and budgeting and preparing for things. Um, so I think my advice would be really start thinking about that plan and write it down. You know, there's tons of resources for these type of things and we'll be talking about in our future presentations. Actually, our, our next one, we'll talk about budgeting. That's a great way to get started. Um, so tune into that webinar so that you can learn more uh, about all the different resources available to help you create those plans. Thank you, Jessica, and I appreciate your response to both scenarios of individuals who actually still have income coming in and to those who have either been laid off or furloughed during this time or, or are seeking employment of some sort at this point, being unemployed. I think that was a great segue into our next slide, which allows us to address uh, the reminders, as we said, April is our financial literacy month. And so we have a great lineup of workshops. April 16th, what Jessica was alluding to, uh, that particular workshop is all about creating and managing a COVID-19 budget. So we have a great uh, list of speakers who will be helping you to understand how to create to devise a budget, uh, assessing what your needs and wants are, and then putting those budgets into place with the help of spending trackers. And so I hope those on the call and uh, will share this information out. On April 21st, we have another workshop, which is on securing relief services during COVID-19. Um, this will be led by another group of partners but in addition, we will have our employee BR team to share some of our internal city employee resources that we offer. April 23rd, breaking down the unemployment process. So if anyone has any specific questions about the impact of unemployment and how to go about just filling out the application and resetting passwords and so forth, April 23rd will address that. On April 28th, we have creating a game plan for emergency response. A deeper dive into planning and uh, allocating funds for appropriate emergency reserves and specific allocations that should be prioritized. On April 30th, assessing spending habits during COVID-19 and beyond, new normal for money management. This is all about shopping, spending with the anticipation that things are going to get back on track 
uh, just helping individuals to know how to go about planning and preparing for uh, the month of May. And then for those who are looking to register, you can go online to brla.gov forward slash COVID workshop and register for any of the workshops that I just listed. Again, this is a series of six total workshops, so I would hope that you all would participate and join us for the upcoming five that we have. I also want to put a teaser out there. We have an incredible list of speakers and some surprise guest speakers that will be on our next call. So I encourage you all to join in and to learn more about financial planning and financial literacy. The final slide, please. So I wanna say a special thank you to all of our partners that have given of their time to uh, the guests that have shared their wisdom and insight on the questions that were posed. If there were any questions that went missed for any reason, we will definitely come back and, and try to respond to you individually. I want to say thank you also to Mayor Broom for her insight and vision in getting us set to start this particular series of workshops. To those on the call, thank you for your participation. Please join us again. Feel free to use the webinar um, information that's listed. If you want to review this webinar again, it will be, it is being recorded where you can watch it. And the link is provided here at um, www.brla.gov forward slash 1083 forward slash Metro 21 dash government dash access dash channel. And once again, you can register for each of the webinars. If you need support, feel free to contact Simone Paulette at spaulette at brla.gov. We look forward to you joining us on Thursday and thank you for your time.